Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending December 3rd. This first one was sent in by my friend Anthony M. It's called Rappin' on Master Lock. Now there's some various news articles that talk about this, but I just, I'm going to go directly to the page that it's referencing on YouTube, and this is a guy named Bosnian Bill, and he is, I don't know, in my mind he seems like a very competent, if not expert, lock-picking person and uh, locksmith. And what he's showing here is your regular number three master lock, which probably sells at almost any hardware store. It's just a medium-sized padlock, which you expect some amount of security from. And by tapping it with a little brass hammer, he opens this lock in like four to five seconds. And I'll just I'll just play the four to five seconds of this video so you can actually see how easy it is to get in this lock. I mean, no having to pick it, nothing like that, just tapping on it. So just take a look at this. I'm just going to use my finger. I'm going to just hold it like that, and then we're going to take a brass hammer, screwdriver handle, or whatever, and you want to wrap it right here. Just give it a few knocks while applying tension, and you will eventually overcome the locking mechanism. So anyway, if you get a chance to check out his channel, you're, it's surprising the amount of locks, especially for Master Lock, but not just them, other places, to where they build them so strong on the outside, and there's some of these locks that are just... They look massive and they're very they're very structurally sound. They're so thick and heavy that nobody's going to probably beat them off with a hand, beat the lock off the, the hasp with a hammer. Nobody's going to cut through the thing with a, a set of bolt cutters unless they got a really huge one. But the thing about them is, if the internal mechanism for locking it doesn't function or is so easy to pick, for example, one of the big uh, master locks that was really super strong, a guy actually here get out of my way, kitty. Here you gotta lay down a little bit. One of the guys actually bought one of those extra expensive, like $50 master locks that was very thick and very uh, break proof as far as the outside. He had a friend of his that had just learned lock picking, so he wasn't very good at it. He picked the lock in less than one minute, and the guy was using this to secure his gate um, to his property so that people wouldn't come in and trespass without his permission. So, uh, yeah, he was uh, kind of disappointed with paying all that money and then having a friend that really wasn't good at picking locks. So, um, watch this guy's channel. He'll tell you, and you, you're going to have to invest a little bit of money if you want a lock. You're not going to get a lock for 8 or $9 at the hardware store and expect that thing to give you anything but just a minimum amount of security. So um, if you really want better security, I'd suggest investing 40 or 50 bucks into a lock. And if you uh, watch some of his videos, he kind of tells you what are the ones that are worth investing money in and the ones that even he has a difficult time picking. I mean, some of the ones, even with his level of expertise, he isn't going to get into these locks right away just because they make them that difficult where even if you're a skilled lock picker, he's he's not even going to get into them that quickly. And next up, this is from Ken G. This is from BBC News Li-Fi, 100 times faster than Wi-Fi. I've seen this technique before where they use light pulses by sending a signal down an electric line. They can use light pulses to control things like thermostats and on-off switches and things like that in buildings, especially large buildings. Uh, very, very effective way to do it. And you're just using the light to produce the digital signals to control whatever, and you'd have a photodiode on whatever you are controlling. Well, this is using it actually for the light to deliver internet speeds itself up to one gig and they say they'll, they'll even go uh, faster than that. It has a potential capability of 224 gigabits per second. Now because it's done through light pulses you're going to have to be in the same room with the light source. Obviously you're going to have to be within sight of the light itself to be able to do this but uh, yeah just using an ordinary and with this it uses a standard LED bulb. I'll uh, read the first couple of paragraphs. Li-Fi can deliver internet access 100 times faster than traditional Wi-Fi, offering speeds of up to 1 gigabyte per second. It requires a light source such as a standard LED bulb, an internet connection, and a photo detector. It was tested this week by Estonian startup Velmini in Tallinn, and I hope I get that right. Velmini uses a Li-Fi enabled light bulb to transmit data at speeds of 1 gigabyte per second. Laboratory tests have shown theoretical speeds of up to 224 gigabits per second. It was tested in an office to allow workers to access the internet and in an industrial space where it provided a, sh a smart lighting solution. So yeah, for just uh, what most people need, I would say that probably would uh, fulfill a need and it'd be uh, less subject to interference too because light pulses don't interfere like radio waves. Like for example, I had two Wi-Fi setups going up in my, going in my house and because they were both operating on channel 11, they interfered with each other until I switched to a different channel. But if you just have uh, light pulses uh, providing your internet, you're not going to get that kind of interference because light photons don't interfere with each other. 
Uh, and this next one is from my friend Brian D. This is from CNN News. Why bananas as we know them might go extinct again. Uh, some of you may not be old enough to remember it. I'm old enough to remember it from uh, 1956 to 1965 when I was a small kid eating bananas. They tasted a lot better than they did now. That's because it's not the same banana you're eating now. Now you're eating a Cavendish banana, but it used to be a thing called a Gros Michel. And it was uh, up until 1965 when it went extinct because of a fusarium disease. Um, they had to end up going to a banana called the Cavendish, which they actually considered at the time a throwaway or a junk banana. But they had no choice because it was the only banana at the time that they could get up to commercial levels of production that was immune to this fusarium disease. And so uh, now they've got another choice to have to make about what they're going to do about this. They had to, uh, in the past, they've had to burn down some of the plantations to keep this thing from uh, spreading. There are the, the fusarium disease, they're calling it, they give it a name called the Tropical Race 4, and it started out in Malaysia around 1990, um, but it spread to different areas, and they're going to try to, if they can, possible, possibly save the banana crop. But, yeah, it's not looking really good. If it gets too much out of hand, um, it could end up being that we'll be shorted, there'll be a shortage of bananas, or the price is going to go sky high, or they'll have to switch to another banana that's even less desirable. It says it's a serious, a serious threat to livelihoods and food security, in the Nampula province, country, and the continent should have spread. And Africa bananas are critical for food security and income generation for more than 100 million people. So the economic devastation this would have. The reason this happens this way is bananas are basically a clone crop. Every every banana plant is, is basically a clone of every other one. So any kind of disease or virus, bacteria, anything like that, that affects one plant is going to infect, uh, going to affect all the plants pretty much equally. So there's no that none of that built-in natural resistance. Now there is... 100 or more different varieties of bananas available so it's not like bananas themselves as a species are going to go extinct but we're going to have to uh, come up with a different kind of solution here find one that's more resistant again or something like that and this last one it's a uh, I actually I think I talked about this before there's a uh, there was a uh, uh, an infection going around, what I should say, an infection or some kind of a, a payload type of thing that came in Word documents. If you're a business, a lot of them were subject to that. And if you opened a Word document, it would have this little payload in it and it would uh, encrypt all your files to where you couldn't get in, get into them. And it would ask, it would also give you a ransom note in exchange, even part of your desktop. Uh, uh, the, the desktop wallpaper was replaced with this ransom note. And I think the typical asking price was around $300 to decrypt it. And I remember when I was talking about it, that one guy just gave up and he couldn't get his files back and he just paid the $300 and he ended up getting his files decrypted. Well, now um, Fabian Wassar of MASoft has created a tool capable of decoding files encrypted by Decryptor Max Ransomware, also known as Crypt Infinite. So if you read this article and do as he says, it's not that difficult to use, but it is time consuming once you do. Um, follow the instructions on how to decrypt it. You're going to have to give it quite a bit of time to chew on this because it's got to go through and uh, break the code and compare the codes and stuff like that and then uh, decrypt your file. But you do have a way of actually being able to do it. It works easy if you have a couple of copies of unencrypted files still available maybe as a backup or something like that. But even if you don't, it says if users don't have at least one file in its unencrypted form, they should take a random PNG file from the web and drag it together with an encrypted PNG image that you can find on your computer. And it'll use that as your two comparison files. And by that, it'll uh, probably by checking them against each other, be able to generate a decryption key and then get all your data back. So that's some good news on the horizon. Um, that's about it for this week. Thank you, everybody that contributed. I really appreciate it. Take care. I will catch you next week.